Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at the autocorrelation functions for time series with ARMA, other regressive moving average models. All right, so uh, what we're going to do, we're going to just dig a little bit deeper, get a little bit more nuanced, more refined look at the autocorrelation function. And then in the next video, we'll look at the partial autocorrelation function. Now, something I need to mention is that we're going to be taking some examples from time series analysis and its applications. Here are the authors. Here's their GitHub page. And this textbook can be downloaded for free through UCF's library. All right, so let's get into it. All right, so consider the moving average process with a degree Q. All right, so it's moving average. Therefore, it's going to be a finite linear combination of white noise, and the expected value is going to be equal to zero. So to see that, I'm just going to say that, you know, X, my time series process, is, you know, using is the theta operator on the back shift operator applied to the white noise time series. And so here, this is how we are defining theta on the back shift operator. So this theta is an operator on the back shift operator, which operates on the time series. Sequence of explanations there. All right. Well, when I do that, the time series that I'm looking at as the moving average is just going to be equal to a finite linear sum times the white noise terms with some back shift on there. And when I use this notation, I'm saying that theta sub zero is equal to one. All right, so now when I take the expected value of this equation, the expected value of my time series is equal to the expected value of the summation. Well, some expected values are linear. So this is equal to the sum of the coefficients times the expected value the expected value of white noise is zero. Therefore, the whole thing is equal to zero. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Now, let's think about the covariance. Auto covariance is. All right, well, the auto covariance of the moving average, you know, I'm just going to specify the shift for this. So now, it's going to be the covariance between x sub t plus h and x sub t. Remember that in this in this situation, this particular model, the covariance only depends on the difference on the index, not the location of the index. All right. And so I'm just going to write down exactly the, the formula I have from up here. Just going to copy and paste that into the formula here. Now realize that instead of just regular old T, I have T plus H on the first one. Now remember that white noise has zero covariance for indices that are not equal to each other. And so that's how we're going to work this out, is that every time the indices do not match up, I know that I have zero. So the remaining ones are just going to be uh, corresponding to uh, the variance of the white noise and the uh, coefficients. And so we'll end up getting this going. And so realize that for this formula, h has to be between 0 and q. And the covariance is going to be equal to 0 if h is greater than q. Remember that when I talk about covariance, negative h and h will give me the same covariance. So we only concern ourselves with the positive case for h. And so here, the covariance of h is equal to the covariance of negative h. And so that's why we only concern ourselves with positive or zero h. Now, because it's a degree q moving average, the qth coefficient is not equal to zero, right? That's how it has to be for us to get that degree. Well, that means if, if I sit down and write this out, that means that the auto covariance cannot itself be equal to zero when we uh, have q for H. So the autocovariance of Q 
is never equal to zero. All right, now if I want, that gives me, this gives me information about the auto covariance. Now, what about the auto correlation? Well, the auto correlation, I just take the covariance divided by the variance, which is going to be the sum of the coefficients squared, and boom, I've got it. Now, remember that we use correlation to understand what's going on with observed data because that's uh, that's always between negative one and one. It's easier for us as humans to interpret. When I'm dealing with theory, usually the proofs are easier if I'm dealing with covariance because I don't have that uh, denominator in the fraction. All right, now let's consider a causal arm of process. So autoregressive moving average, we're going to say degree P on the autoregressive part and degree Q on the moving average part. Okay, so let's go ahead and write this using the back shift operator notation and the polynomial phi and the polynomial theta, or actually the operators that correspond to the polynomials phi and theta. Now, for causal, when I say causal, I need to have all the roots of phi need to be greater than one in magnitude. They have to be outside the unit circle. All right, so as we work through this video, when I need it, I'm, only, I'm just going to go ahead and make the assumption that I have roots outside the unit circle whenever I would need that to make my proof work, work out. Okay, so now if I have a causal process, that means I can write X in terms of the white noise. Okay, well, if, now when I say in terms of white noise, that could be the entire infinite time series of white noise. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and just say that X sub T is equal to all of the white noise time series times coefficients of psi added up. Okay, well, when I do this, if I want to take the expected value in this situation, then the expected value of X is, of course, the expected value of X. I'm replacing X with the summation on the white noise. Now, I'm going to bring the expected value on the inside. Now, this is not a trivial step to go from here. To go from here to here. Okay, so what is happening? Remember that expected value is integration. Integration is, you know, a, the limit of a Riemann sum. So there is an infinite, there are not an infinite, but there is a limit here and there is a limit here because I have infinitely many terms. Now, if you take a more advanced uh, proof-based course, you'll work out that in this particular situation, it's okay for us to switch the order of limits. If you take a mathematical analysis course, you'll learn that switching the orders of limits is not a trivial thing, that we always have to be mindful that if I have limit and limit, I can't switch the order of things freely. Here, it's okay. Other situations, it's not. But then, once I can sw switch them up, because that works out if we, we sit down and did those proofs, then I have the summation of the expected values times the coefficients. Well, the expected values are all equal to zero. That means that the add-ins are all equal to zero. Infinite sum of zeros is still zero. Okay, so now let's go ahead and compute the auto covariance of our autoregressive moving average process. All right, so I'm going to do the same thing I always do. Now, when I do this, I'm going to take the covariance of X sub T plus H and X sub T, and it's going to work out that I'm just going to uh, put in the this representation of the, the corresponding representation here of X sub T plus H I'm going to put this inside for here. And what's uh, going to end up happening is that everything's going to work out exactly the way I want it. And boom, we're going to get our, uh, our uh, covariance, our covariance. And then easy peasy lemon squeezy, I'm going to get my correlation by dividing by the auto covariance at zero. All right, so now that's one way to do this. Let's try another way. Let's do this in another 
manner to see if we can get another result out of just rewriting the same equation in a different way. All right, so I want to have this equation, but I want to use a different representation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the x of t plus h, and I'm going to replace it with the process that we get as an autoregressive moving average model. Okay, so once I do that, notice I have all of this here, and I have this. So I want to take the covariance of the two things. Well, here I have two sums and a covariance. So I'm going to break up the sums in this manner. You notice that x sub t is in both of these covariances. OK, so now I see that I have a summation with the random variable, random variable, summation with the random variable here. OK, mm -hmm. so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to apply the finite linear aspect of covariance to pull out the summation and the coefficients. And that pulls them out here, pulls them out here. Okay, well, at this point, I know what this is. This is the covariance of H minus J. So I'm going to go ahead and just rewrite this part here. Okay, okay, that's looking good. Now we have a little bit more work to do. I'm going to, I look here, I see that I've got that white noise. Well, can't I represent that using white noise? Yes, I can. You betcha, I'm going to replace x sub t with its white noise representation. Now, I'm going to do the same trick I did a moment ago of pulling out the summation and the coefficients out here. And when I do that, I have just the covariance on the white noise terms here. So now, I look at that and I realize the vast majority of those terms in the summation, the infinitely many, the vast majority of them are equal to zero. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get rid of all the ones that aren't equal to zero, and things are gonna reduce down nicely. And when I'm all done with that, things are gonna clean up. Here, I, I did this in two steps on reducing the down to the non-zero terms. And we ultimately have this here, these coefficients times the covariance. And you'll notice that we have the same subscript, same index for both of these. So then I know, since the subscripts are equal to each other, I know that this covariance is, in fact, the variance of the uh, white noise. So I'll go ahead and just slap that in there. This is a constant in terms of the summation, so I can factor it out. All right, so now if I think about this, I realize that when I look at the formulas that we just built up, all right, so here I have the auto covariance on H is equal to this. And I know that the auto covariance is also equal to that. Now, for larger values, it's equal to zero. But I know that for large values of H, the auto covariance is going to be, um, you know, is going to, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to have zero for this part here. So what this is going to do, this is going to give me a general homogeneous equation to work with. And so for a causal ARMA process, we're going to get this autocorrelation equation as a general homogeneous equation to work with, and where these are our initial conditions, which you'll notice come from the result here. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. 
for this find the autocorrelation function of a uh, autoregressive degree p process and we're going to say that the moving average aspect is not part of it we're going to say a degree zero for the moving average well then just by what we've worked out we have that autocorrelation of h minus this is equal to zero for all larger values of h okay so now what we're going to do, we're going to say that phi has all roots outside of the unit circle, and the roots have multiplicity m1, m2, m3, all the way up to mr. This is a mis this slash right there is a mistake, by the way. And all, of course, multiplicities add up to the degree of the polynomial, which is degree p, because we have autoregressive degree p. Now we're going to go through, and if I work through the difference equations that we worked looked at in a previous video, then we realize that we can rewrite our correlation in terms of a bunch of polynomials times uh, inverse inverses of our roots to a power, specifically to a power of h. If I just sit down and work that out, if I work out all of so the punchline of this is not what the solution is, it's what the solution looks like. That it's going to be a polynomial times the inverse of the root to the power of h. And h is on the inside of the polynomial. I'm going to add these all up. All right, now remember that h has to be larger than p. So if we have a causal process, then all of the roots are greater than one in magnitude. Okay, well, if I look here, z sub j is greater than one in magnitude, and I start taking negative powers, then that's going to go to zero as h goes to infinity. Now, it, if I have a polynomial, that's going to have a fixed constant and a fixed degree, and it's going to work out that that exponential uh, exponentially fast going to zero is going to uh, go to zero faster than the polynomial could grow as h gets large. And so then each of these individual terms are going to go to zero as h goes to infinity. And I have a finite sum of these things are going to zero. Therefore, the whole correlation goes to zero as h goes to infinity and it, and it decreases exponentially fast. Now, if we have conjugate roots, then the conjugates are going to cancel each other out. So the uh, the imaginary parts will be canceled out and the dampening will look sinusoidal. So things will appear to be cyclic. Okay, so now let's take an example. This time we're gonna do autoregressive degree one and moving average degree one model. So let's go ahead and say that X sub T is equal to a constant times a previous x value times so plus a constant times previous white noise plus the new white noise value. And we're going to go ahead and say that phi is less than one in magnitude. OK, well, by the autocorrelation work that we just did, we know that we have this equation. Well, very quickly, very easily, I can work out that the auto covariance is going to be equal to a constant times the power of phi. And here is going to be my initial conditions. When I plug in zero, here's the initial condition when I plug in one. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the equation I have here, my initial conditions, and I'm just going to plug things in and see what I get. All right, so we can see that the constant is equal to autocorrelation at one divided by the coefficient. And then just doing some plugging and chugging, we can see that here is our general autocovariance function. When I divide by the uh, autocovariance at zero, I get the uh, autocorrelation. And I can see that the fundamental important aspect is that I have the constant uh, to the power of h 
going on. And since the constant is less than one in magnitude, we know that that's going to shrink down. Now, if I look back at the autocorrelation of an AR1 and an ARMA11 model, these are going to be similar because of that geometric aspect. And so in real life, if I had data, and I would not, it'd be really hard for me to be able to tell, is this an AR1 or is this an ARMA11 model? All right, well, that's all I've got for you. Life is short, do math.